Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacy LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Ashley Morrison. Ashley has fostered over 300 cats and kittens over the last four years after fostering her first bottle baby kittens in 2015. Since then, she's developed a passion for TNR, cat advocacy, and sharing her experiences with others to show the importance of animal rescue work. Ashley, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about how you got started. I mean, 300 cats and kittens over the last four years. That is a lot of cats and kittens. So <laughs> It is. It's too many. So tell me about the uh, the intense passion you developed over the last like five years, or, or what was your aha moment in terms of uh, getting into this like crazy cat world? So, you know, I started fostering dogs when I lived in LA, and I was dog walking and all that stuff. Um, I came back to Washington, and I was volunteering at Paws in Linwood, just dog walking, you know, weekly. And I had just signed up. I was there for like a week or two. Um, and unfortunately, I lost my dad to suicide. And the reason I mentioned that is because I talk about it on my page a lot. I'm very open open about mental health and and how fostering has really, you know, helped me so profusely. So I basically told them, you know, I can't commit to coming in right now. I'm I just want to be at home. You know, I don't want to leave my house. And they said, well, what can we do for you? And I said, I just want something small and fluffy. And uh, that is how I got my first bottle babies. And, you know, I figured, hey, you know, they lost their mom. I lost my dad. Neither of us, you know, I'm not sleeping. I shouldn't say neither of us. They sleep like 22 hours a day. (laughs) But, you know, I might as well get up and try and save these these little creatures. And I it really just helped me and my mom through the grieving process. And we didn't realize this passion and love we had for these little innocent creatures creatures. I had never been, you know, a huge cat fanatic. I was mostly a dog person growing up, but I was always an animal person. And I just couldn't believe how much I fell in love with these little creatures and the love we could give to each other during hard times. So you were there with your mom. So your mom helped out a little bit too? Yeah. So we lived together for about uh, almost four years after my dad passed. I just recently moved out on my own so I could have my own two foster rooms. But, you know, she's all in for my uh, crazy catness. And, I'll, you know, I'll often have to call her and be like, hey, I need a overflow room at your house still. Or um, can you come and drop by and feed the kittens? Or, you know, I need your help cleaning. I'm begging you, you know. Yeah, she's been absolutely amazing with it. And she's completely all about the kittens as well. How do you think it helped you in the grieving process? Was it just a distraction? Or was it something that really helped you work through the process of dealing with the loss of a parent? I would say a little bit of both. In the beginning, you know, you're just at home crying, basically, and you don't want to leave. And the only reason you have to get out of bed is these tiny kittens, because if you don't get out of bed, they don't get fed. So all of a sudden we had a reason to be getting out of bed. We had a reason other than people would come over like for the memorial. And instead of us all just being completely sad the whole time, we would have a reason to smile. We would look down at these little tiny babies that would put a smile on our face. So they were an amazing distraction. And then, of course, when I started to lose my first foster kittens, occasionally they do pass away from congenital issues or whatever the case is. I would start to cry even harder than I normally should or when I'm saying goodbye to a litter, you know, and I'm like, okay, Mm. wait a minute. Why am I crying so hard about saying goodbye? You know, here I am in the back of the shelter, just bawling my eyes out, telling them I love them so much. And I'm so sorry I have to leave you. And I'm like, there's got to be more to this. You know, Mm -hmm. it definitely brought to my attention the need, one, therapy, just to talk through things and just my own mental health needs and that I had to take care of myself before I could take care of these little creatures. So you very accurately self-identified some needs that you needed, but I think that there are many that are in the animal welfare space that struggle with compassion fatigue issues. And there's certainly maybe other issues that feed into that and may not be that Mm self-aware. Are there any things that you can suggest to try and help us through the trying times of compassion fatigue? Yeah, it's very real. Um, And, you know, during the summer, I have a hard time saying no. And so I will wind up with 30 plus fosters. And all of a sudden, I am just 
completely overwhelmed and I've completely done it to myself, but I'm, you know, like, okay, I have to remember that I'm a human being too. And I need to be able to leave my house for more than two hours. And I need to be able to be in public around people and not just around kittens 24 seven, because it is what we love. And we're very empathetic people, I think. And so we start to give more of ourselves than we should at times. For me, it's kind of about backing out of the cat world for a little bit and finding things that have absolutely nothing to do with animals. Like for one, I like to go to my cabin and be able to just do absolutely nothing related to the kittens and not have to clean every few hours and not have to be on a feeding schedule. If I want to go out to dinner and have a drink, I can stay out till 11. I don't need to be home by 6 p.m. to feed. And I always tell people, even during the day when you are going through those crazy times where you have... Of 20 foster kittens, I always will take a break and just go wander Target or something just to get out of the house. Because the most important thing you can do is to get out and be around people. Don't just isolate yourself. That can definitely become a problem if you isolate yourself in the name of animals. The one thing that I find, as you say, you have a hard time saying no. Mm -hmm. So you get in this sort of downward spiral of Mm -hmm. things. And the one thing that always comes to my mind is what is it that changes your behavior or assistance or creating the stop? And I know I can make the change because I feel like with some people that have a really hard time and sometimes don't ever come Mm -hmm. out of that abyss, they don't even know what to grab at to pull them out of the hole. I mean, I guess is that where, you know, friends and intervention come into play? or I mean luckily I haven't gotten to that point yeah. but you know I definitely think you start to learn the further you get into animal rescue what your limitations are in the beginning I was fostering for shelters and so if I wanted to go on vacation or I felt like I was being overrun by foster kittens I could just pack them up and bring them right back and they would transfer them to another foster home but now that I'm doing it independently there's no one to transfer them to you know it's me I I Even if I do find a foster home, the responsibility of taking care of their medical needs and everything does fall on me. You know, I'm I'm practically a little mini shelter. So it's just becoming me learning what my limitations are, how many I cannot say yes to. Um, And I've definitely started working with more local rescues and shelters, being able to transfer kittens to them that I receive. And it's just because of my social media following that people now often message me and ask if I can take these kittens. And as where I used to be like, yes, of course, you know, I'll take them. Now I'm like, yes, I can, but I'm going to transfer them to Seattle Humane or I'm going to look for a foster home for them because I have to remember that I need to have a life too. So you mentioned, you use the word that you are now a freelancer. So it means Mm -hmm. you're specifically not affiliated with an organization. And it sounds like you have partnerships with various Mm -hmm. organizations that you would transfer out to do adoptions and help open up space for yourself. Mm -hmm. Was that a conscious decision? It was. Well, I'll I'll say a little bit of both. Because of my social media growing, I was being reached out to more often. And the problem you have working with a shelter is that not a problem, they're doing amazing stuff, but you cannot take in animals like from the street because of disease control. So if you have a litter that is currently you're fostering for the shelter, say, you know, you find a litter of kittens on the street, you can't bring them into your house because the shelter is concerned that you're bringing a disease in that could affect their kittens. All of a sudden, I keep getting asked to take in kittens, and I can't because I still have fosters from a shelter. And I thought, okay, I've got to make a change. You know, I'm to that point where I get reached out to so often, and I want to be able to do more. And so I switched from working with the shelter to doing everything myself. You specifically only do bottle babies, or do you do other kittens too now? No, in fact, I'm I I love bottle babies, but I also love my sleep, and so <laughs> you know. I'm not. One I'm of, on there. I'm with you um, on that one. <laughs> you know, I wish I was one of those people that was like, yeah, it's no big deal. I wake up every two hours, but I'm like that. I sleep all day. You know, I'm always exhausted. No, I'll take in really anything. Um, right now I have two moms with 12 babies between them. Wow. Um, and, and here I thought, oh, it'll be easy. They have their moms, but it turned out they were both so malnourished that they weren't producing milk. So here I was bottle feeding 12 babies for a few weeks. And, um, you know, I'll take in, I did, you know, just recently have a bottle baby named Betty and I'll do it whenever I need to. I, 
absolutely love helping them, but I have, you know, no qualms taking in little three week olds found on the side of the freeway or moms with babies that need a place to stay until her babies are ready to go and keep them out of a shelter environment if I can. Hey everybody, Stacy here with the Community Cats Podcast. And I just wanted to let everybody know that early bird ticketing is open for our 2020 online cat conference, which will be on January 24th through the 26th. So we will get together on the evening of the 24th with Chelsea White, who has a YouTube show that's perfectly awesome. And then we will be getting together on the 25th and the 26th for two full days of jam-packed information all about community cats and community cat programs. So this is a virtual convention for anyone who'd like to help community cats. So this is the time to get signed up and join our online cat conference for the early bird ticket price of $50. So please go to onlinecatconference.com to sign up today. Also, if you'd like to become an affiliate as a fundraiser for your organization, the information is right there on the website, as well as sponsorship opportunities. So I hope you'll check it out. Go to www.onlinecatconference.com and we look forward to seeing you then. Hey everyone, Hooch and I are here today to talk about Dr. Elsie's cat litter. Dr. Elsie's cat litter is known to be the best litter on the market and Hooch agrees. Many of you know that Hooch was a foster cat of mine that I adopted while at the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. We did use the Touch of Outdoors litter as we transitioned him from being an indoor-outdoor kitty to an indoor-only kitty. I'm thrilled that Hooch found his home with me, but there were many times when folks would call me saying their kitty didn't use the litter box. I was also thrilled that Dr. Elsie's Cat Attract litter came out as it gave me a resource to share with others that was affordable and in most cases successful in keeping this kitty in their home. As a special benefit to Community Cats podcast listeners, Dr. Elsie's is offering a rebate up to $20 off your first bag of any Dr. Elsie's litter. Just visit drelsies.com forward slash Community Cats podcast to print your rebate or fill out the online form. Try Dr. Elsie's today and you won't regret it. Tell me a little bit about your social media. You've referenced it a fair amount. Mm -hmm. When did you get started doing social media and what's happened as a result of that? You know, I I was posting pictures of the kittens and stuff on my own personal pages and I thought, okay, my friends are going to kill me. I'm I'm posting way too much (laughs) about cats. And my neighbor at my cabin, April, was like, "You have got to start a cat Instagram." I thought, oh, "I don't know. I don't. I don't know if it's really going to do anything." But I figured, "Why not?" So I started it, and it just started to grow, and and videos started to be shared worldwide, and articles, and all this stuff. It just grew and grew. All of a sudden, you know, I had all these people from all over the world following along with these stories, and hopefully learning something new on top of being able to watch our little adventures we go through with these guys. Are there educational videos there or is it mainly photos, just pictures? I mean, are you trying to actually teach people what it's like to be a foster home with the hopes that maybe more people will be a foster home in their area? Absolutely. And a lot of people, you know, I always love to see the comments. I started fostering because I saw that, you know, you said we need more foster homes and it's so true. But I always say I try to draw people in with the cute videos and the cute pictures. And once you're there, though, I try to keep you (laughs) by either, you know, funny captions or whatever. But the whole goal is that you stay and you see what it is really to work in animal rescue and fostering and that you too can be a part of it. It doesn't mean that you have to be fostering 30 cats like I am. You know, you don't have to be fostering these huge groups of kittens. You can go to your local shelter and foster a 10-year-old cat that just needs to be out of the shelter to recover from an upper respiratory infection. There are so many fosters that don't even take much of your time. So even if you do have a nine to five, you can still foster a mom with babies or kittens that are weaned. There's so many groups of animals. I think people don't realize that they themselves could foster. They just immediately assume like, well, but but look how much work she does. But that's because I always take in, you know, the most sick kittens I can find because I love a challenge. Do you ever take in semi-feral kittens? I am bad with feral cats. I will say that (laughs) I, you know, they always say like, don't show your fear. And I am not good at that. I show my fear. (laughs) 
scared. But uh, feral kittens, yes. I had uh, three little babies last year. I had found and fixed the male cat of the colony, and his name was Stud Muffin because <laughs> he liked to get around that neighborhood. And a few months later, I found who I am so positive was his kitten. So I named him Stuffin because it was Thanksgiving time and it was Stud Muffin shortened. And then uh, Cranberry and Sweet Potato, his siblings, and they were all semi feral. They had been living outside in blackberry bushes and were terrified of me. It took a long time and a lot of cuddling and treats and toys and stuff for them to realize I wasn't a mean person, that living inside was actually a pretty good life. And uh, they are all happily adopted and very social cats now. Do you do adoptions on your own or are you primarily transferring them out to other organizations? I mean, do you get them spayed and neutered and get all the stuff done? Yeah. So there's an amazing organization near me, which is just so lucky for me because a lot of people I know do not have this, but it is called Feral Cat Spay and Neuter. First of all, they do um, feral cats for free to TNR them. And then if I want to bring in any of my kittens, once they're two months and two pounds, it's only $15 to neuter a male and 25 to spay a female. So I get all of mine spayed and neutered, microchipped. They've had at least one, if not two vaccines by the time they leave. They're dewormed. They get all the good stuff. And then I do, I would say 95% of my adoptions are just through me. You know, I have a a contract with all my little rules and regulations, no decline. They're going to be indoor pets, you know, unless they're on a harness or leash. Um, The only times I really have to transfer out those kittens to another place to be adopted is if I'm just super overrun and don't have the time and energy to go through all those adoption applications and do it all myself. Then I know I need help and I need to transfer it. If someone's thinking about fostering kittens, we can't be choosy about what we receive for foster care. I would say most people would probably be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you got bottle babe kittens as your like first litter of kittens yeah. to foster because they think, oh no, we need to practice and have you with like a regular set of kittens yeah. and then maybe something with upper respiratory and then progress upwards. Are you of that mindset or are you like, just take what society gives me and we'll all figure it out? You know, I think you just kind of go dive in to whatever they need you to take. Unfortunately, there's not enough homes for bottle babies, and there's often not a lot of people that want to take on the medical cases. There's so many resources out there, though, now that while you will be supported, of course, by the shelter or rescue and letting you know exactly what you need to do for them, there's also so many resources online that can help you. You know, like Kitten Lady just came out with that whole book on kitten care. There's so many things that you can do to look up exactly how you need to help and treat these kittens and how to take care of bottle babies. I truly believe anyone can do it, even if they have not had experience. Now you're in Washington state and I'm in the Northeast and you're in the Northwest. And, you know, I hear all the time in New England and referencing the Northwest too, is that, you know, we have a reduction in the overpopulation of cats. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've sensed over the last five or six years, or are you just so right in the trenches that you're not necessarily getting a sense of overpopulation numbers declining? I would say that I haven't been deep into the TNR world long enough to know that. I'd say I more have been on the fostering side. The TNR I've only really gotten into the last couple years. So I wish I knew more. But I will say that Washington is one of the most adopting states. I think people get the fair assumption here that there is no shortage of homes just because we adopt so much. But the truth is that we're also taking in animals from Texas and California and all these other overpopulated states. So we absolutely still have too many pets looking for homes. And the problem is that while we might be the most adopting state, we have all these neighboring states that are not. And there are pets that sit there in shelters for sometimes years So I just always encourage people to adopt locally is exactly why I don't usually adopt out of state is, you know, people will contact me on my Instagram and say, you know, I'm in New York and I really want to adopt a kitten. I say, please go to your local shelter because we are the most adopting state. It's likely they're going to be adopted here a lot faster, but in New York, they're going to be there a lot longer. So the population might be reducing, but it's not to the point yet where there's not still thousands of animals and shelters that need homes. Do you utilize your social media as a fundraising tool? Oh, absolutely. It's the only way I can do the amount of work that I do. 
I initially, of course, was fostering through a shelter. So they were supplying all the medical care, food if I needed it, you know, beds, toys, things like that. But as I continued and as I switched to freelance, I thought, oh no, how am I going to do this? <laughs> but people have been so supportive and so amazing. And the moment I have a sick kitten that needs to go to the eye doctor for a specialist or needs an MRI, you know, I raise those funds within a couple of days. People are honestly more kind than I expected and very supportive of my work. And I often hear, you know, if I can't do it myself, I want to be able to help you do it. And it's just made a world of difference and been able to make it so that I can help the amount of animals that I do. Yeah, that's a very hot topic because whether it's the very young or the very old, both age groups have a lot of medical costs usually wrapped up in their care. Yeah. And that that is a very big topic of how to handle those oftentimes sort of surprising emergency medical costs. Yeah. And we're very reactive in our fundraising around that, which is somewhat necessary because you didn't know it was coming your way. And now here's right. a new expense that you weren't anticipating. But a lot of board of directors in the nonprofit world, they don't like that because they like predictability. They like budgets. They like everything sure. sort of solid and predictable. And unfortunately, that's not the way the world works. It sounds like you're out there, you're reaching out to your community, you're saying, hey, I've got this emergency situation. I need to raise X dollars. Do you feel like you ever get donor fatigue with that? Yeah. I mean, I get fatigued just asking for it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't like to be prodding people every day, you know, we need more donations. We need, you know, because they're already helping me and that's already asking a lot. I keep a fund for my animals. So anything that is left over stays in that fund until I need it for the next time. You can get credit cards now through PayPal and Venmo. So when people donate to PayPal or Venmo, I just use the cards and they go straight out of that account to pay for medical bills. So usually we'll wind up raising more than we needed for a certain bill. And then I just won't have to ask the next time that we have an emergency vet situation or something like that, because I completely understand not wanting to have your page just look like all you do is ask for money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that can definitely be an, an awkward situation if you're asking too often. But I think a lot of people also understand that that's what happens in animal rescue. It's just like you said, it's unpredictable. I took in those kittens thinking, okay, they're covered in fleas, they're malnourished, but I can get them you know, a lot healthier. But what you don't expect is that four of them needed to go to an eye specialist. Another couple of them wound up having to have emergency vet appointments for stomach issues and lethargy and just things that you wouldn't have expected. But I think people understand that. And a lot of people that used to work in animal rescue understand it and they wind up donating still. And um, so, yeah. So if folks are interested in finding out more about the work that you're doing and how to help you, how would they do that? So you can find me on Instagram and Facebook on youngest old cat lady. I'm not very good at it, but I am on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, yeah, follow along and follow our stories and love to share what I do with the world. Is there anything else, Ashley, that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Just the mindset that you can make a difference. I think a lot of people think that fostering means they have to take on this giant responsibility. But the reality is that you can change one kitten or one cat's life just by being willing to give them the space in your bathroom or your space in your extra bedroom for a few short weeks. It's not going to be as much work as you thought to just have a pair of little kittens that need to get over a cold and it keeps them out of the shelter and in a less stressful environment and gives them a place to rest till they can be adopted. And it really is something that once you have done it, you realize that you're making a difference and it's helping you just as much as it helps them. And uh, it can be amazing for your own mental health and you will just love it. Well, Ashley, Hooch and I would like to thank you again for agreeing <laughs> to be a guest on my show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's good talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 